Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager of Data Diversity. We'd like to thank you for joining the, today's webinar. Today, Adrian will discuss the disappearing data scientist. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag SmartData. If you'd like to chat with us and with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the top right-hand corner for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Adrian Bowles. Adrian is an industry analyst and recovering academic, providing research and advisory services for buyers, sellers, and investors in emerging technology markets. His coverage areas include cognitive computing, big data analytics, the Internet of Things, and cloud computing. Adrian co-authored Cognitive Computing and Big Data Analytics, published by Wiley in 2015, and is currently writing a book on the business and societal impact of these emerging technologies. Adrian earned his BA in Psychology and MS in Computer Science from SUNY Binghamton and his PhD in Computer Science from Northwestern University. And with that, I will give the floor to Adrian to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Great. Thank you very much, Shannon, and welcome to everyone. Um, so, the disappearing data scientist. Yes, it's a provocative title, and that was the intent. Um, like many of you, I've been reading uh, almost constantly about how important data scientists are and how few there are and how much money they're making and all that exciting stuff. So, I thought I would talk about um, how long we're going to need them and what the future looks like. So, let's dive right in. He said, hoping to get to the next slide. There we go. Uh, from The Guardian, one of my favorite newspapers, used to be the Manchester Guardian, in their career choices section, they had an article called, What's a Data Scientist and How Do I Become One? And this is really sort of typical of the things that have been in the press for a while. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about what the roles are and where it goes, but what I wanted to point out here is, uh, in their headline, it says there's a shortage of data scientists, companies looking for programmers and analytical thinkers to plug the gap. And my favorite was, the next three years offer a veritable gold mine for data scientists. Before you get too excited, the fine print at the bottom will tell you that that was published just over three years ago. So, what comes next? What we're going to talk about today is, what is a data scientist? Uh, I assume most of you have some working definition, but I want to uh, focus on the things that I think are important in that role and then talk about how the role is going to change based on technology, uh, why that's inevitable, why it's already happening, and what the, uh, the role of the tools will be going forward, and talk a little bit about the tools that are out there to augment or automate data science. So let's get right into it. When I think of data science, I think of a discipline uh, and a person who is a data scientist is someone who can identify and interpret business needs. Uh, basically, it means it's a, a person that can talk to business users that have requirements, that understand that there is some data or that if they had the right data, they could make some decisions. And generally, it's all about making decisions and discoveries. There's a lot of D words here today. But a data scientist is someone who can not only uh, formulate a problem statement based on a business requirement, but identify uh, the appropriate data, understand what that data is in terms of form, and uh, prepare it for analysis, whether that's cleansing, whether that's aggregating, whether that's sampling. Uh, it's a set of tools and techniques that they have to have available to them. And then analyze the data. And for analysis, uh, if if we're talking about some of the, I would consider to be a professional data scientist, they need to have at their disposal a variety of tools. And one of the, the hallmarks of a professional is they know which tools to use in which circumstance. You may be able to get away with using the wrong tool. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, in some uh, areas, and in some areas, the use of the wrong tool is going to be pretty obvious pretty quickly. But when you're dealing with numbers and analysis and largely statistics, probability and statistics, it's often the case that um, 
the results look perfectly valid, but they're meaningless. And so the, uh, the important part of being a data scientist, or to me, one of the most important parts, is that it's someone that can find the right tools, find the right um, approach to the data, to analyze it in a way that makes sense, and then interpret that. And the last one, tell the story. A data scientist really is a business storyteller who's telling, uh, I think of it as a narrative based on quantitative data. So in terms of uh, education or skills, we need a fair amount of probability and statistics, some other mathematical techniques. I think it's important to have some background in experimental design because a lot of times the types of tasks that uh, are being handed off to data scientists are research tasks and you want to know if one thing is better than another or if one thing implies something else or if there's correlation or if there's causation. So it's setting up that um, process. So it's being able to understand the data, understand the appropriate process, and then communicate the results in a way that makes sense and enable um, a business user to make a decision. So let's look at a couple of the, uh, the different extremes. And if you've been on uh, any of the other webinars where I do a lot with um, machine learning, you'll see that there's an overlap here. So if you look on the left, and uh, think of these uh, two circles being the center of a, um, a clock, and the red definition is the starting point. So on the left side, we're going to start with a problem definition. Business user has a problem, communicates it to the data scientist. The data scientist goes through the data discovery, preparation, modeling, analysis, interpretation, and then uh, preparing the results. That's uh, probably the one we think of most, where there is some problem and we want to solve it. And a data scientist can be thought of as a professional that comes in to interpret the need. The other side uh, is a little different, uh, similar in some ways, but it's going to use a different set of tools. And in that case, we're going to start with data discovery, we'll go through the preparation, the modeling, et cetera, looking for patterns that we didn't know existed. So on the first side, it's I want to know um, what happened in the southeast region in terms of sales, and can I use that data plus some weather data to predict what's going to happen in the northwest next year? I know what the problem is. On the right side, we're looking for discovery. So it's just kind of like the difference between, I like to think of it as the difference between science and engineering. On the left side, we know what uh, we're looking for. On the right side, we're looking for something new. We're looking for patterns. And the reason we would uh, employ the services of a data scientist in this area is that generally we're talking about a lot of data. And so it's not uh, necessarily uh, a simple thing where you're going to plug in uh, data from your stores into a spreadsheet and do a quick model, a couple of uh, macros. What you need to be able to do is to integrate data from a variety of sources and figure out what's important, what's contributing to uh, your results. So left side is, here's the problem, tell me what the answer is. Right side, here's the data, tell me what you think. And in terms of the relationship between that and uh, machine learning, what we're talking about on the left side is uh, basically what you think of as supervised learning where we know um, we have some sample data, we know uh, the relationships between the data, and we're looking to classify things. On the right side, we have a lot of data. We don't know what's in there, or we don't know what the relationship is uh, or what relationships are between different uh, segments. So that's um, a couple of different skills that both use uh, the underlying um, education and skill set I just described for data scientists. What I'd like to do now is just spend a couple of minutes talking about what I think of as the natural order of things, because that'll set us up for where I think things are going and why some aspects of the data science role are going to disappear. And my basic premise is that for many uh, technology-driven roles, 
the natural order is that we will go from very heavy reliance on humans to humans augmented by technology to humans possibly being replaced by technology. I'm going to give two examples. First is uh, obviously telephone operators here. If you looked at the um, rate of adoption of telephones uh, worldwide, you would be able to track back to a time when the ratio of telephones to operators, uh, sorry, the ratio of operators to telephones was pretty high. You needed a lot of uh, humans in the loop to make connections between people um, on the phone. The rate of adoption of telephones is growing fast enough that if you were to just plot that out before we talked about data science, a simple plot that said, okay, the population is growing at X rate, the adoption is growing at Y rate, uh, there would come a time in that graph where every human being would need to be a telephone operator, and after that, you would have, um, have a real problem. Well, of course, if we think of a telephone operator as a profession, which it was for decades, that didn't happen. But if we think about it as a role or as a um, task, then that did happen because basically we are all telephone operators every time you make a call. You do more work today to make a call than uh, you did in the days when you could just pick up the phone and ask an operator to do it for you. The technology enabled us to replace the human element, uh, for better or for worse, with a distribution of the task to the people who would benefit from it, namely the people who are calling or the people who are receiving phone calls. So the, the scope of the problem in this case was huge. Uh, it was going to be uh, without, um, without a massive change in the technology, an intractable problem. The technology was, by today's standard, uh, relatively simple, but the impact was high. And the, the key to this is just that we changed the, the distribution of work, if you will, and substituted technology for human labor. And one way of looking at it is de-skilled the job. And that de-skilled uh, word is very important. Uh, I'm assuming that most of the people on the webinar today have not been telephone operators, that hasn't been a, a big uh, employment opportunity for decades. But in my next example, this is uh, very relevant to those of us in technology today, it's programmers. If you were to look at the field of programming in the 50s, 60s, 70s, and see what happened in terms of the requirement, the demand for programmers, you would see that the, uh, the cost of programmers was high, the demand was outstripping the supply, but around the 60s and 70s, we started to see some major changes in the way programming was done. What I'm talking about here is things like uh, going to higher level languages and going to uh, uh, processes like structured programming. And the reason I bring this up is because this, unlike um, the telephone operator, programmers haven't gone away. And certainly there's a high demand for them today. But if we were still coding everything in assembly language, not very much abstraction there, uh, we would be already at a point where pretty much everyone would have to be a programmer. And that was avoided, if you will, by changing the tools. So it changed the roles. And now the majority of people that are programming are using higher level tools. They're using uh, higher level techniques from uh, structured, object-oriented, uh, agile, a lot of different um, things that work together. Sometimes they're complementary. But basically, the nature of the job, uh, while it may look similar, you're writing uh, something that ends up in code, the tools that are being used provide a lot more power to the individual programmer. We also see, in, uh, in many cases, that uh, tools have been developed to allow 
end users, business users, if you will, to generate the functionality, whether it's by uh, using tools that generate code or just interpret the user's requirements in such a way that programming isn't required. And I will just uh, give you one point of reference. Back in the 70s, there was a book by a sociologist called Philip Kraft on uh, the relationship between programmers, managers, and work in the U.S. And his premise as a sociologist was basically that uh, structured programming was, I don't want to overstate this, but uh, it was pretty close to structured programming was a plot to de-skill workers. And so if you look at the skill level of the individual that was required to be a programmer, that certainly changed. And what's happened now is over the years, the, um, the skill level to write software has changed. You need a different skill set. You don't need to know as much about the underlying machine because everything is at a higher level of abstraction. But the end result, if we were to measure in terms of uh, productivity, what was being delivered by programmers today is uh, much higher than what was being delivered by the folks that, uh, that knew more about the underlying structure years ago. And I use those two examples uh, to kind of set up the, the stage for where I think things are going with data scientists. The issue today, uh, it's, it's well known that um, trained people, uh, trained data scientists are in high demand. Uh, and I was going to have a slide with all the crazy ads that I've seen, you know, become a data scientist in eight weeks or six weeks, or we can do it in four weeks, or, you know, learn Excel and become a data scientist. What's really happening is that um, in those cases, I think the, the definition of data science is being watered down. I will say that data science is one of those terms that, uh, that I wish would go away. Uh, anyone who is a scientist in the natural sciences or the social sciences uh, probably has the required skills to do this um, analysis using data and the recognition of the relationship between patterns in data and experimental design. So someone who is a data scientist but isn't a scientist in another field uh, is kind of an interesting anomaly in, in the greater scheme of things. But what's happening is we're reaching the point where there's so much data, there's so much expectation uh, that we can analyze that data, that people are trying to, um, I don't say glorify the role of data science, it's a very important role, but trying to distribute that to people and create these tools that are analogous to uh, self-service where you dial the telephone yourself or, um, higher order languages in programming or application generators where the some of those skills that we talked about are now being um, assigned or uh, delegated to machines. So let's take a look at those trends. The natural progression, if you follow from the telephone operator example through the uh, probably more of a direct comparison to programming is, that to begin with, we would have uh, a business user, IT, typically uh, in a large enterprise will maintain control over the data, uh, which makes sense for things like uh, security and access and um, being able to recover from disasters, et cetera. And the business users have to interface with IT to put in a request. You may have a business analyst in there who's somewhere between the two, maybe somebody that, uh, is in business but speaks IT, or someone that's in IT but speaks business. <coughs> Excuse me. Moving to sort of the, the popular model today, which is have a data scientist who has access to the data that may still be owned, if you will, by IT, although sometimes uh, we're having localized uh, repositories of data. But the data scientist is the interface with the business user. Where it's going, and this is the model that I hope to show you in the next 10 or 15 minutes why this is uh, almost inevitable, is that the data will be the central focus. IT uh, may still control it, but the interface 
is that the business user will have control over the uh, management, the update, the analysis, and it won't require the direct intervention in general, there's always exceptions, of IT or a data scientist. And how's that going to happen? Well, one of the things that, that I always try to, um, to make sure we, we make very explicit is that in any field, there's probably a selection of tools that you'll have to use across your career. And this happens to be a, a subset of the tools that you would have to uh, use if you were working on something like an old MG. Yes, it's my garage. And it's important to know which tools to use when. It may look like you can substitute one for another, but there's a big difference between using a brass hammer, which won't spark uh, in a gas environment, and a rubber mallet. So you need to know or the, the role needs to know whether that role is being performed by human labor or digital labor, part of the digital workforce, you need to know which tools to use at which time and how to use them. So I, I use the phrase, it's a, the tools plus the knowledge. It's not, you can't have uh, one without the other. I refer back to Tom DeMarco's quote, that uh, a fool with a tool is still a fool. You need to have that explicit knowledge to be able to select the right tool at the right time. In data science, the tools that we're looking at are things um, like all the different algorithms, the different um, processes, the different um, technical tools. I'm just using the uh, Machine Learning Studio uh, from Microsoft Azure as an example because they have a nice uh, representation here that lays out a lot of different tools and what they're for, clustering tools, recommendation tools, regression tools, et cetera, and what types of data. It's a nice visual that if you are a data science, sorry, data scientist, or aspiring data scientist, this should make a lot of sense to you. You know when you're trying to solve different type of problems, which one of these you're going to use, whether you're going to use a boosted decision tree or a decision forest or a um, feature, hash, feature hashing in text analytics. That's not necessarily, well, it's almost never intuitive to a business user. And so the, the interface between the person with the business analysis problem and this set of tools is today typically the data scientist. What we want to look at is what is going to enable us, what is starting to enable us already to change the, the tools that are available uh, to diminish the need for those specific skills. So the forces that are driving self-service data, sorry, self-service data science are pretty simple. The issues are that the growth in data is undisputably um, very high. I don't need to quantify it. Everybody would understand that between um, deep structured data and uh, surface structured data, uh, something we call unstructured versus structured data, natural language, text, et cetera, uh, more is being produced every day. And there's an expectation that uh, since the statistical tools and the analysis tools or algorithms anyway are available to solve problems that uh, any business that has the data should be able to use it. So it's the data growth combined with the lack of skills in most enterprises that are um, creating this demand. And what works along with that in terms of creating the opportunities or this issues plus demand is that more and more in business, the spend that we would traditionally think of as going to IT anything solving information or data problems is being uh, controlled by uh, the business units rather than being allocated to IT and then controlled and then parceled back to business, if you will. And on the supply side, what is make, creating the opportunity, so we've got the demand and we've got the opportunity, is that a number of artificial intelligence technologies are maturing to the point where they can augment the business analysis requirements, and in some cases automate them. In some cases, we can see ahead that it's going to be automated, but right now it's going to be augmented. 
So we want to look at that process. So to do that, we need to understand of the major tasks for a data scientist, which of these can be automated? Identifying and interpreting the business need, identifying and preparing data, analysis, and interpretation. And with interpretation, I would include storytelling. Uh, I should probably make that explicit. And before we go on uh, to the next few slides, I want to just uh, have you think about this for So identifying and interpreting the business need. Uh, typically, if we're dealing with a business user, let's say a marketing manager, who's talking to a data scientist, uh, they may have a specific requirement. I need to be able to do this kind of a forecast. I need to be able to do this kind of a root cause analysis uh, and have the, uh, have the data scientist interpret that and put that into a plan, create a model. All right, this is what we're going to do. And what's important to understand is that the way that process typically works is it starts with a conversation. So the business user can communicate in natural language. Uh, maybe they're having a conversation, maybe they're writing it out, uh, maybe they have some formal spec that they have to create. But the input to the data scientist is natural language. And in natural language, the skill that the data scientist has to have at that point is to be able to understand those requirements, which uh, in NLP terms, that's natural language understanding. You need to be able to classify uh, what that problem is. Is it something that you've seen before? Is it something new? It's a classification issue here based on the natural language understanding. And then match that to the data. So the first step is some natural language understanding. Okay. A lot of technology has been developed to help with that. Um, we've talked about it in a number of the other webinars, but just as an example, there are dozens of uh, systems out there today ranging from uh, what I think of as AI-based chatbots to uh, more comprehensive natural language understanding, all the way up to something as sophisticated as um, the IBM debater uh, system that was unveiled about a month ago to classify and understand arguments and understand nuances in those requirements. So that is something that today uh, a lot of progress is being made. It's certainly, uh, if you were to have a, um, an accurate dimension for um, understanding business requirements in natural language, you would see a spike in that over the last uh, four or five years. So that's promising. Identifying and preparing the data. If you have already taken that input and put it in a form, perhaps a knowledge graph, something like that, where you can represent the, um, uh, the request, the problem statement in a complete, consistent, and unambiguous form, and you can understand the concepts, what you're looking for, then mapping that to the data to see if the data that can answer that question uh, is available. That's something that uh, is, uh, I certainly don't want to say trivial, um, but it is a problem that is becoming increasingly solvable with off-the-shelf technology. And by that, I mean that uh, we can model the data that we have and we can model the requirement and do a, a mapping and see what needs to be done. Now, the analysis, that's where the, uh, the skills of the data scientist are largely um, Initially, uh, a case of identifying what type of analysis. If you go back to that uh, couple of slides ago showing all the different tools, um, and that is sometimes, well, that's a function of both the, the data itself and the problem you're trying to solve. That's something that we can do in a semi-automatic automated fashion now, and I'll give some examples in a minute. And then the last part, interpretation and uh, storytelling, this is where a good human data um, scientist can not only uh, show you the numbers, but tell you what they mean. And that telling you what they mean is going beyond presenting a, uh, a spreadsheet. These are the answers that you asked for to telling the story. What does it mean? How did we get these results? What is the significance? And uh, I will 
show you in the last couple of slides that there's some really interesting advances in natural language generation that are already being used in business intelligence uh, tools or being adopted right now that will get us to that point. So, excuse me. So my simple graph here is that self-service self data science, which means that uh, the role of the data scientist as an individual is diminishing and it's being distributed to people with the problem, uh, is being enabled by tools that combine business intelligence functionality and artificial intelligence to drive the selection of functionality within the BI tools. So put this in a, a simple chart, the properties of the data plus the type of um, problem that we're trying to solve plus the use of machine learning is what gets us to this model generation automation and pulling the human out of the loop. And I hope it's obvious that, uh, that I'm simplifying this somewhat, but this is a, a trend and we're already seeing a lot of progress in here. So when I say the properties of the data, the, the there's an old saying, um, Louis Sullivan, uh, architect from Chicago, wrote that form follows function and the, the, the reason I bring that up is once you've described the problem, in some cases you've almost uh, by default defined the possible solutions, the, the way to approach it. So once you have that statement of what it is you're looking for and you know what data is available, what's in the universe of data, you have the properties of the data, you know what the analysis is, uh, that's going to drive you to a decision. Now, I should point out that in that middle area where I say comparative analysis uh, or user interrogation, what I'm getting at is that a data scientist, uh, after getting the problem specification, may end up looking at, well, how, are there other solutions of similar problems been solved? Can I follow from that? Or do I need more in information, that's the user interrogation. And one of the important things that a good data scientist will be able to do is to actually probe for more information. So if you've been looking at systems like um, oh, IBM Watson in healthcare where uh, the system has been developed to recognize when it has um, a set of symptoms that if it had certain other information, um, it could increase the confidence of a diagnosis, the system will actually ask. It's like a, a doctor is uh, talking to you and says, okay, I think it's one of these three things. If I give you this test, I can eliminate two of them or I can you know, improve the confidence. The interrogation, it's that interaction, it's that conversation with the user that's currently largely the job of the data scientist. And then machine learning that will improve the process going forward. So the trend is in going from uh, structured queries, which may be SQL, uh, that is very data centric. It's the, the way we interact with the data is to have, frankly, the, the people that are generating the queries think like the machine to more natural uh, interaction for this interrogation. So uh, being able to uh, use visual tools and uh, perhaps not as uh, simple as the pen and ink tool here, but the visual tools to be able to interrogate which databases you want to include uh, and move things around on our chart to decide uh, what path you want to take to a natural language interface where a user instead of uh, speaking to a data scientist, can describe the problem in uh, scripted or, uh, or unscripted natural language. So the trend is going from having the user have to think like the machine to having the machine, uh, I'm using air quotes here, think like the user. It's having the machine being able to um, classify the natural language input into something that uh, 
that enables it to perform the analysis. That was, I'm sorry, let me go back. So that was for a problem definition, that first step. When we get into data exploration, it's very similar. We go from interactive to conversational. And what I mean by that is interactive uh, stimulus response, uh, input query, and uh, demand for more information to something that is more um, natural language-like. And again, it's putting more of the um, the power or more of the uh, the interpretation, if you will, um, that role is going to the machine using uh, artificial intelligence, natural language understanding technologies, largely powered by machine learning, to enable a conversation between a business user and a business intelligence system. So I like to think of this as being more of a distributed analysis and the, the simple um, analogy is that the person that has the problem by eliminating the intermediate step, if the tools become powerful enough that the tools can interpret the user need based on natural language description and not have the business user uh, have to understand the all the different options, if you will, um, that is going to reduce the demand for uh, data scientists that we have today. Right now, in the marketplace, there are lots of tools out there that do general business analysis. <coughs> Excuse me. So what I have here is a, a representative set or list. And these are vendors that have products in the market today that are beginning to meet the self-service data science demand. And the reason I've included these, uh, first of all, they are, each of them has uh, one or more of these technologies that are being automated. Uh, they're in alphabetical order. Don't read anything into uh, the order other than in alphabetical. Um, What's interesting to me is that all the traditional vendors that have had analysis tools that um, that haven't required what we think of as data science or perhaps some of the more sophisticated levels of statistical analysis um, are now beginning to offer uh, the more sophisticated analysis and making it easier for the users with uh, less sophistication, if you will, to use them. And so uh, it, it's all across the board. When I said that uh, you need to look at which aspects of the data science process can be automated, um, it, I, my belief at this point, and I think it's being demonstrated uh, in, in some of these companies, is that virtually all of it can be automated, which doesn't mean that that's the best solution. I get to that as we, we come to the close of the slides. The last part of it, which I think is still a huge part of the data scientist's job, which is storytelling, is now um, being automated. And this is a trend, really, I would say that uh, what we see today, the, the seeds for this were sown three or four years ago. But this is a, a map showing uh, a number of those um, products and, and vendors that have the automated BI tools that are becoming data science tools and how they map to two of the leading vendors who offer natural language generation tools, narrative science out of uh, Chicago and automated insights out of North Carolina. Uh, you'll see that uh, for the, the major players, Microsoft, MicroStrategy, Click, and Tableau are offering integration with both narrative science and automated insights tools. And uh, the reason this is important is both of those companies, narrative science and automated insights, are really known for creating products that allow you to generate uh, natural language narrative from data. So if your data comes in, it's a, uh, um, a spreadsheet or a database, it's something that has been uh, ordered into a surface structure form. The 
tools, uh, narrative science with uh, Quill, and automated insights with Wordsmith, and some of the other tools that are out there, can, by understanding what the, the position is in that table, if it's in a tabular form or in a graph, can generate a narrative. And these have been used quite successfully in um, things like uh, reporting, writing stories uh, based on box scores from sports. You know, if you were to look at the, uh, the box score from, score from the baseball game, uh, the tools here could generate pretty much a play-by-play -play based on the numbers in the actual box score. And you can uh, adjust for tone and things like that. Um, and tone based on context. Well, in the case of data science, what's happening is the results of that analysis, assuming you got the right analysis, we're gonna work from back to front now, assuming you got the right analysis, uh, having a tool like this enables uh, more than just creating a um, visualization of the data, more than a, you know, a pie chart, something like that. So it, it augments the tools that have been improving over the last decade for visualization to say, okay, well, now we have the data, we can visualize it and we can hear about it, if you will, you know, as a narrative. So I think that's a, a pretty important uh, step forward. But all that presupposes that the data that it's working from is accurate. If you're generating uh, sports stories and these tools, some of these tools were used for things like uh, the recent Olympics reporting there are sports that perhaps don't warrant uh, the assignment of a, a high-paid reporter or even a low-paid reporter. Uh, so it can be generated very quickly from the data that comes in. But that data is presumed to be accurate. If you're doing analysis and your business's future depends on it, um, it doesn't matter that you have a great visualization or a great narrative if the data itself was wrong. So that's going to bring, as we start to wind up here, get into some uh, to the Q and A, the um, I'll just quickly go over the, the findings part and really focus on the recommendations. The demand for these tools is going to continue unabated, uh, probably increase over the next five years. Go back to one of my first slides where the Guardian said. You know, it's going to be fantastic for three years, but that was three years ago. It hasn't gone down. Um, that prediction or projection was based on uh, some research done by McKinsey in terms of the uh, number of data science jobs that were available and their projection for the number that were uh, going to be available over the next several years. So the demand is going to continue to drive self-service analytics, which is what uh, the replacement is. But the quality, the quality of automation versus augmentation, automation is when the person would be taken out of the loop versus augmentation where the person stays in the loop but is able to do more. Um, that varies widely right now. And that's why in, in that chart, I didn't um, rank those companies. The, the products themselves are changing so rapidly that uh, I, I didn't want to put that out there. I will say that if people are interested in specific tools or trends and, and want to follow up with me, I'm happy to do that. You can get my contact information in the next slide. But basically, the biggest benefits that we're getting right now are coming from uh, advances in artificial intelligence, tools and algorithms uh, developed for classification problems, which is really the, the ultimate sweet spot for um, deep learning and machine learning, and natural language processing technologies. What I showed it in the uh, slide just previously is that everybody is now, or many of the companies now, are moving towards uh, creating storytelling BI tools, if you will. And as I said, that's a huge um, part of being a good data scientist. That um, the maturity of natural language generation tools uh, is, is really remarkable over the last five years, I would say. Um, and if you look at how they can um, 
tell a compelling story based just on the data and the tuning of the algorithms for the generation, I think that part is just about where it needs to be. It's the beginning part that is still somewhat problematic. It's the natural language understanding that allows you to decide which algorithms to apply. A lot of the tools out there today um, where they where they save a lot of time is by being able to um, recommend which uh, specific algorithm or which two or three algorithms, which way to analyze. But where the issue is, is they can um, present you with a number of different alternatives, present you with different um, quantitative answers. And if you were to uh, add in the natural language uh, generation tools, they could tell you different stories based on a different interpretation. But if they don't have the right, if, if they haven't understood and represented the problem in the optimal way, uh, you get to the situation where you're going to get a bad answer faster and you may not know it. Now, I would say that the, the overall state of the industry is very encouraging. Uh, if I were in a situation where my option was to wait uh, six months to a year to be able to hire a data scientist or train some people, I'm, I'm not uh, singling out any particular institute that does four, six, eight week training as being deficient, but if my business depended on it, I would be cautious right now. I would employ these tools uh, as an alternative to waiting, but I would want to have, I would want to see them today even if the tool is touted as something that can uh, automate the task, I would treat them as something that augments the, uh, the role. So the recommendations here, kind of pulling it all together, is I know I used uh, citizen data scientist in, in the description of the, uh, the webinar. It's becoming a term of art and it's, um, I guess I'm getting to be a curmudgeon. There are so many terms that I really don't like at the moment, but the idea is a uh, citizen data scientist is like a citizen reporter, or journalist, whatever, someone that isn't formally trained in a discipline, but is able to um, carry out some of the tasks based on uh, being enabled by tools. Don't think in terms of making everybody um, a data scientist, that's not going to happen. Think about the productivity of the individuals what their role actually is and how some of these tools can augment their role. But uh, what I would strongly recommend is that in sufficiently large organizations to allow the, um, the business users, not that you could stop them anyway with their own budget, but perhaps to encourage them to use some of these tools to generate different models and alternatives but to still have people trained as data scientists, they would just be able to serve and support more people because they're going to be reviewing um, input that is uh, that has been pre-processed, if you will. So that will make the uh, business user more productive and it'll make the data scientists more productive. And I would say that uh, since most organizations by this point um, unless it's a, a brand new organization, you probably already got a business intelligence tool or a, a number of them in-house. Start by looking at their, um, their roadmap for automating these various tasks um, to see whether they're um, sufficiently employing. I mean, it's, it's a lot easier to say we have natural language understanding and we have uh, model generation than it is to do it right. And if you have uh, questions on that, Again, happy to, to talk to people offline. But number three, train the users on the analysis fundamentals and experimental design. I think that I probably should have put that as the, the first one. The tools, they're designed to be easy, and certainly they look easy, but if you don't understand what you're doing, at least at a, a surface level in terms of um, experimental design, probability, and statistics, uh, you're not going to articulate your problem in a way that will get the right answer. So you can't get around, you, you can't democratize data science 
by throwing tools at a problem when the problem is understanding. These tools are becoming more intelligent, again, air quotes around intelligent, uh, all the time. They're getting better at understanding the intent and the context and being able to represent that and use that to guide their algorithm selection, but they're not there yet and it's, it's not their problem. Um, it, it's the problem of the business user to make sure that they're getting a meaningful result, not just a, um, a repeatable result. So I think it's important to, if you're looking at new tools, to test the interfaces. Uh, some classes or some individuals are going to have uh, different reactions to narrative versus visualization, and uh, the, the progression from interactive to really conversational systems um, that should be very simple for, uh, for users to make that leap. But I would uh, strongly um, encourage uh, creative testing before we make any commitment to one of the new interfaces. And finally, um, although I said it's a, it's a disappearing data scientist, and uh, I think it's pretty compelling that the demand for uh, fully trained data scientists with um, with the level of sophistication that, that you see in job requirements today is going to soften. Uh, it's, it's certainly not going to be the case that um, the job itself is going to go away in the next few years. So I have uh, sons ranging from 20 to 23. People ask, oh, should I, I have my, my child become a data scientist? Yeah, it's not a, a bad thing, but personally, I think that the the better course of study, if you're uh, on the younger side, is to focus on a specific science that you're interested in and you learn enough about data science to be able to apply it. But if you're at a point in your career where you're looking to improve your credentials and uh, open up some opportunities, a combination of a foundation of business skills plus um, even a few weeks of uh, data science instruction will probably make you more valuable in your organization. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Shannon. Adrian, thank you so much for this great presentation. And we've got questions coming in already. If you have questions, feel free to submit them in the bottom right-hand corner in the Q&A section. And just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording of this session, as well as anything else requested throughout. So um, diving right in here, Adrian, so I find it a scary concept to automate analytics to the point where business users are performing their own analysis with without the knowledge of an operational research analyst. How would self-service data science have the same level of quality? Ah, thank you for the question. And I, um, I, I think the more you know about analytics, the more frightened you may be. So I, I empathize with you on that. In terms of the quality, the real area that I worry about, and that's why, you know, in the last few minutes I tried to work from uh, end result back to the front. Once the data, it, if we've done the right analysis, the reporting, the interpretation of the, the results, that is is very well under control right now. The quality right now is determined by the quality of the the model, if you will. Uh, which is basically a representation of the understanding of the data scientists. And right now, uh, I hope I didn't give the impression that you could pull out the best of the data scientists out there and replace it with any level of, of the tool. That is not the case. I do think that the quality of analysis performed by people who are titled or self-titled data scientists today varies. And if I were to try and do a, a quick graph, I would say that the folks that are probably the weakest on the human data science scale are probably the ones that could be most effectively augmented or, or replaced by automation. Um, the, the real issue here to me, and 
I don't want to diminish the, uh, I think the person's uh, word was scary. I don't want to diminish that. I have for a long time felt that uh, the choosing the right tools and with tools, I include algorithms, um, is something that typically for a good data scientist, that's a, that's an iterative process, that's a conversation. And um, that is more of the human side than the quantitative side would be my, my quick um, take on that. And so the thing that's going to get get us to the stage where we are less frightened of this and more confident in it is the exact same thing that gets us to that stage with things like um, medical diagnostics. It's that the representation and the interrogation, if you will, of the user is sufficiently rigorous and um, the feedback given by the system to the user that says, this is what I think you're asking and this is why, um, as that gets refined, um, that gives me more confidence. It, it, I often go back to a, a memorable scene at, at camp as a kid when a counselor said, which is more dangerous, a sharp knife or a dull knife? And my, my immediate thought was, well, it's a sharp knife if it's used um, improperly, because you can hurt yourself, but it's a dull knife if it's used properly, because it's not gonna react the way it should. And I think it's the same thing here with the tools. If you can uh, articulate what the problem is that you're gonna solve, that you need solved in a way that the system, this um, digital, <laughs> digital data scientist, if you will, instead of a human data scientist, um, the more you can remove that ambiguity by successive refinement, uh, the more confidence you'll have it. So Adrian, how do you see traditional BI solving the differentiating uh, or and differentiating itself from the various practices of data science, which in many ways encroach on BI territory, or is there even a need to do so? Um, uh, personally, I think the need, the the distinctions are going to become um, less and less important to the point where, you know, what we think of as BI is, you know, it, it's part of the toolkit. And I don't think that any uh, vendor that has been in the business for a while as a BI vendor uh, is going to be able to resist the temptation of branding themselves in the data science world, if not actually uh, moving into that. It, it's that automation um, of helping the the user of the tool uh, require less sophistication about the, the underlying technology. It's like, you know, I mentioned the, the telephone operator. It's like an automobile. I, I Most of the people I know, when you get in the car and turn the key, have no idea what's going on uh, past that point. And that's okay, but that's okay because the need to know has been abstracted out, if you will. And that's where uh, where I see the, the future here in terms of these tools. So the, the BI uh, vendors that uh, have been around for ages, uh, you know, I spent a couple of days with folks at uh, MicroStrategy recently and they're on, I forget which version that they're on, their basic tools, but there's a company that's been around for a very long time, uh, incrementally improving. Uh, one of their differentiators was uh, early to the mobile market, but they're one of the companies that's using um, natural language generation. They're, they're experimenting with AI in a, a variety of areas. I don't think anybody has the answer today where I would say, oh yeah, I'm a a Fortune 50 company, I don't need any data scientists. I can give somebody on the loading dock access to this um, data scientist in a box application and we'll get the right answer. We're not there yet. Uh, the, the point that I wanted to leave everybody with today is that we are getting to the point where some reasonable percentage of the problems are currently uh, being solved by data scientists 
could be solved by the business users directly with better tools and the technologies to build those tools are maturing fast enough that I, that I see that happening in the next few years. Well, that brings us right to the top of the hour. Adrian, thank you so much for this great presentation. Thanks to our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. I love all the chat that's been going on and all the questions coming in. Again, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email by end of day Monday with links to the slides and links to the recording. Adrian, thank you, and I uh, hope everyone has a great day. Thanks. Take care. Thank you. Bye.